Hello there. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, I'm Karen Anderson. I'm the president-elect of the RIS, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you today. This lunchtime, we're going to be um, hearing about Cuddy Moss from Anne Nisbet Studios. Anne is going to um, speak for about 20 minutes about the, about, about the project. And after that, we're going to hear about Papal Steading in East Lothian from Ian Parsons and Stuart Cameron of Cameron Webster Studios. Following that, um, we'll have an opportunity to discuss the projects. So um, throughout each of the presentations, please feel free um, to put any questions in the Q&A section and even in the chat, I'll try and pick it up as well um, so that we can actually use these when, we, when it comes to the, um, the, the discussion session. So um, without any more ado, it um, um, gives me a great pleasure to introduce Anne Nesbitt. Thanks, Karen. Just going to share that. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yeah, so initial um, conversations with our client Scott commenced a year before he purchased the site. A simple exchange of emails discussing interest in language, ornithology, travel and design took place while he searched for a rural site. Scott's a bird watcher and a bird photographer and therefore it was important that his house be in an area where he could engage with the landscape, wildlife and the bird life. His house at the time was about 12 miles from the site so he knew this area of North Ayrshire well and this um, we've been asked quite a lot but it's not a second home, this is uh, Scott's permanent home. So after four or five months, Scott disclosed that he'd seen this ruin that he was interested in. It was not in the market, but he'd approached the owner to see if he'd be interested in selling the site to him. So we were involved in the project for over 12 months before our client owned the ruin and the site. And the project has been, I suppose, what we like to call a slow architecture project. So the project has been staged over a few years with small interventions still to come. And in my view, this approach has been beneficial to the project. So the site is in a rural area of North Ayrshire and the landscape in this part of North Ayrshire is much more undulating, it's intimate and tactile than the larger open agricultural landscape that is common in North Ayrshire. So uh, this is the site here. So a single track road forms the south boundary um, and there was an existing track that ran up to the ruin with three um, ash trees. And the site here uh, rises from the southwest to the northeast, and the structure is long and narrow and gently steps down to the west. So this was the ruin um, at the time of our initial visit. There was uh, four external stone walls and a dilapidated internal um, stone wall that you can see there. Uh, the roof had collapsed in uh, several years before and slate and rubble and timbers filled the ruin. Um, inside there was just a concrete slab and two single brick dividing walls and some cattle feeding trays. So the remnants of um, the, the cow buyer that was the, the last use of the building. So this is looking west onto the kind of east gable here. You can see that that's the brick dividing wall inside and uh, we look out onto this kind of wider landscape to the west. Uh, and this is the main um, kind of south aspect which looks onto the single track road and for us that was the more kind of formal elevation, the one that you could see from the road and it was the one that was most intact. And this is to the to the north. So as you can see, the site has minimal biodiversity due to overgrazing, and there is very few trees on the site. Uh, this is inside the ruin. Uh, and so um Scott and I's 
uh, this is Scott, is first meeting on site was when the core ideas of the project were discussed and agreed. This is a very early photo of Scott on site, so I always think he looks a little apprehensive about having purchased the site. And he always tells me that he was just worried about how he would get into this building. So during this uh, meeting, we discussed the aesthetics of the dilapidated ruin and its connection with the landscape and to those who lived and worked and survived on the land there. We discussed ideas about custodianship rather than ownership. Scott felt that he had responsibility over the ruin and that he saw himself as a custodian uh, rather than the owner. It was important to him that the ruin remained as an entity in its own right with only minor amendments. So the new intervention should be able to be removed in the distant future with only small traces of this project left so that future generations could become custodians and redevelop the ruin if required. So we discussed that the ruin was a patchwork of amendments carried out for functional reasons. So windows and doorways were infilled, others had been widened. Really, um, the work was done to the building when and when it was required for functional reasons. For me, I suppose ruins are really timeless structures in the landscape. Having grown up in Le Cabre in the West Coast Highlands, they're emotive and many symbolize you know, loss of people, loss of language and loss of culture. They're these kind of timeless structures that neither are in the past or the present, um, nor are they internal or external. They're uh, in and in between and it, this kind of unique space which is connected to another time. So our aims for this project to were to avoid domesticating the ruin or restoring it to a romanticized version of itself, but instead to retain the feeling of a ruin and gently elevate the narrative and the aesthetic that is embedded in the fabric of the existing structure and surrounding landscape. So a kind of simple, honest approach connecting the ruin and landscape both internally and externally, and a light touch approach with a focus on reuse and making do with what is available. So every part of the existing ruin was measured and documented. We had surveys of the building undertaken and then I spent a few days on site measuring and observing the building's details and materials. A set of drawings and diagrams were produced illustrating the evolution of the structure from its original condition in the early 1800s through several iterations until uh, what we see now. Rock levels were recorded and the internal floor levels were set to follow the natural rock levels. So this required, um, this removed the requirement for rock breaking, reduced the volume of concrete required within the building, and the foundations were cast onto the rock where possible, and no underpinning was required. So the floor levels follow the external landscape, allowing you to experience the, the external landscape levels as you journey through the building. So yeah, the ruins were a patchwork of modifications formed over the 200 years from windstone, sandstone, local brick and shuttered agricultural concrete. So it not only charted the immediate history of the site, but also the wider landscape and materials used or produced in this area of North Ayrshire over the last few hundred years. So we reviewed historic maps and found several small windstone quarries within the proximity of the ruin. And we suspect it's this uh, quarry here where the stone from Cuddy Moss came from. Um, and North Ayrshire had a considerable number of brick foundries, all now gone. Um, the red brick that was used to infill the existing openings and create new op openings is Dalry brick, which, which was made in the Cars brickworks in Dalry, which was fairly local to the site. And there's also a large sections, oh, sorry. Uh, of kind of cannibalized sandstone, which were all in the wrong places. Uh, so they've been removed and just re and then just been used to repair parts of the ruin. So you can see this at the top of that west gable um, just here. So um, a concept of an intervention within the ruin was developed. This explored inserting an insulated timber frame building within the existing stone structure 
allowing the windows to set, be set back from the original stone openings, creating these um, full deep reveals and visually creating two entities, the new and the old. Uh, the steelwork was exposed internally, um, so we brought it inside the building, uh, inside the timber frame to avoid cold bridging. This also allowed the timber frame to be removed in the future, should it be required at the end of the building's life. And we felt that this approach followed that kind of honest ethos that we set out at the beginning of the project. So externally, the ruin was gently repaired, celebrating the many modifications through its history. Uh, the cement mortar was removed and the windstone brick and sandstone was repointed with lime mortar. Um, all but one of the agricultural concrete lintels were reused. Um, we used reclaimed Scottish slate. 20% um, of this came from the site, which Scott had gathered and stacked. Um, we reused stone coping pieces. Uh, these were salvaged from a nearby ruin, which had been recently demolished. We did ask for permission. Um, and all but two of the existing infilled openings were reopened and the two remaining were retained and repointed. So you can just see the ghost of a previous opening here. And we also um, infilled some openings. So one existing opening in the East Gable, which is near the access road here, was refilled and infilled with a uh, dull rye brick. We actually, we couldn't source any dull rye brick and we uh, looked everywhere to see if we could get a source of dull rye brick. Um, and the client was actually out looking, um, monitoring kestrels in a disused quarry in North Ayrshire and came across um, some red brick that had just been dumped there. So um, we were, Delighted to get some dull rye brick and it certainly fitted in with the um, reuse strategy that we had. And there's only one new opening that was introduced into the building and that's this one here which has been uh, created on the front elevation and the treatment of this was quite different. We used a aluminium frame, like a box frame, just a really honest approach to say that this was a new window. It brings in um, more side light and it's just a hint on that front elevation onto the road that something is um, going on behind this building. And then a new building is located perpendicular to the ruin here and a retaining wall was constructed along the east elevation, which nestles the building into the landscape and keeps the new building below the ridge of the ruin. It's just a simple volume, which emulates the form and proportions of the existing stone building. Uh, but there was many iterations of this. Uh, we looked at uh, Core 10 initially and uh, decided that although it had the rawness and would weather, um, we felt that um, it didn't sit in harmony with the ruin. We also looked at zinc, um, which we felt was almost too pristine for the building. And so we, uh, in the end, decided to progress with a natural weathered larch, which covers both the external walls and the roof, a restrained aesthetic, which works in harmony with the lime mortar and the stone and brick cladding. Uh, and then we introduced a glass link. So it's rooted into the stone wall in the ruin and creates this connection between the buildings. Um, and it also creates separation between the old and the new. And this is a kind of close up of that. And then we added a utilitarian third building that sits here um, and parking just tucked in behind it. And this is in the context of the ruin. It's um, clad completely in black charred larch. Um, so complements um, the, the other cluster of buildings, but also uh, uses a slightly different language since it's a, a more utilitarian building. 
So um, we enter on the north side of the building here um, through a weathered timber door with a cast uh, metal handle. You enter a lobby space here and the ceiling is kept low, kind of referencing the idea of the cottage. Uh, it's got a bedroom to each of the ends with main living spaces uh, centrally located. And this is when you come into the lobby here. And there's a stone wall that runs, that we rebuilt, which uh, was the stone wall that was uh, existing in the building that runs across the building at this point. Here. Yeah, so this is the lobby. This is the stone wall in the lobby as you come in and uh, going up these steps into that end bedroom. There we go. Uh, and then this large south facing window frames an existing window opening. So it's highlighting the stone angles and creating this view through a historic view. I suppose for me, it's a moment to connect with the many others who've stood and looked out over the 200 year history of this building. So this is the stone wall here that you can see. And this is the bedroom space here. Um, we've got this, um, it's open to the apex and there's this little window. Uh, on the gable that we retained and we even retained the old timber um, window frame that was once in there. And this is the bathroom where we uh, used the stone wall in the shower as well and exposed that stone wall just so that you're always connected with the older parts of the building. Now as you move from the lobby into the main space, um, you move from that lower um, space, darker space, uh, into uh, the main living spaces, which is open to the apex and is, is a significant change of um, height and light. We've got these exposed steel that we talked about earlier. We've introduced um, south light from the roof into the space and these um, stair and stove set as objects in this space here. And this roof sails all the way over this mezzanine space that holds the study. And this is the route down to the master bedroom. The raw steel stairs. Um, and as you can see, these take you up to the study there and bedroom here. Um, and you can see from this section about how the building steps down with the landscape. And because of that step in landscape, we need, we're able to create this extra bedroom up here and the master bedroom underneath. So this is the master bedroom here with these frameless glazing that connects the bedroom uh, to the outside landscape. Um, and we've got large sliding doors which allow the bathroom and bedroom to become one space. We've got very few um, kind of swing doors or uh, hinge doors in this building to, to allow a flow through the building. And this is you come back out of the bedroom. This is looking the other way. This is the kitchen kind of carved into this end wall. And this is the route into the glass link in the new build. So you can just see the kind of new part of the building against the old. And then just coming through the glass link plane again with taking the uh, external material into the building and creating these kind of deeper angles and timber. And then this is living space. So quite a difference in language here from the, the main part of the building, frameless glazing, just connecting you to the outdoors, a change of them flooring from the polished concrete to the timber uh, and exposed um, steel here as well. And then just again, carving in some storage into this back wall and you can see this route back into the ruin. And this is just the perfect place to sit with the landscape so close to the building for a client to bird watch. Um, and when you're sitting there, um, all of this grass is just moving continuously. So it's quite hypnotic. Um, and then um, the building, you know, Scott is obviously a bird watcher. Uh, wildlife and biodiversity was important. So there's a lot of native trees planted now around the site. We left the landscape in natural and wild and took it right up to the building, which also creates habitat for other um, 
animals and, and there's increased bird life around the site. Um, these deep reveals uh, in the ruin encourage um, birds to nest in them. So this summer there were swallows nesting in the deep reveals. And in the lintels above all the windows, we left gaps so that these spaces here are uh, perfect places for bats to roost. So there is actually bats now roosting in the building. And we were talking the other day that we would potentially get some cameras up to just to see how many bats are roosting in this building. And then um, this little window that uh, we talked about before, we cooled in the glazing on this window and it's become a perfect place for owls to roost. So this is off the camera that the client has set up. This is a barn owl coming in and the barn owl is visiting pretty much every night now. And we've uh, recently started to see that Tawny Owl has uh, also uh, started to use the space. Um, and they actually, the owls sit here and um, uh, hunt. So yeah, so we've ended up not only creating a, a home for Scott, but a home for quite a lot of animals and birds as well. And I'm just gonna finish on that one, which shows the building and the landscape. Um, so thank you, and pass you over to Karen. Thank you so much, Anne, it's fantastic. It, you know, it just illustrates the really, um, the format of these in details are, fun, are really good because it's, it's just so nice to hear you as the architect talking about you, your experience from day one with the client and, and your, your approach to the site, which is, is, is very, very sensitive and thoughtful. I just can't help but thinking, you know, you describe it as light touch, but it's based on deep in, deep in engagement, deep deep research in the first place and um, engagement with the site. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I noticed that the chat is um, is quiet and there's no Q's and A's in the, the, um, in the box. So please do um, put your comments, your thoughts in there because It'll be really useful as, as we move in, into the discussion session. Um, our, our next um, building is um, Papal uh, Studio, Steading. Sorry, I'm getting my studios and my steadings mixed up. Um, and it's um, by Ian Parsons and Cameron Webster. Um, they're both going to speak about it, starting with, with Ian. And it's, it's really interesting to reflect that what we've got today is, is two ex-agricultural buildings, both um, 19th century um, originally. And, and just to look at one in the west, one in the west, one in the east, um, different approaches. So it's, it's really an excellent mix of two buildings. So um, again, I'll just hand over to Ian in the first instance to tell us about the project. Thanks, Ian. Hello. Um, very different project, much bigger, much larger scale, very different landscape, half, half the rainfall. Um, we were commissioned to do phase one of the project. And so we, we just talking about phase one of really quite a long term project. Um, screen sharing. Um, this is the, and my involvement is as a conservation architect working with, with Stuart on the project. Um, this is the south elevation of the south block, which was where we, we started. Um, as the project developed, it extended and we included two or three more aspects. Um, this is a general view of the setting, which this part of the setting is phase two very splendid west elevation. And we, we were looking at the southern part of that. Um, as the project progressed, the field and the farmhouse was included and also a wood to, to further to the right of this picture. Um, my involvement was probably stimulated because I was the architect for the, the farmhouse beyond. I'm, I'm going to read a lot here, I apologize, but this is the, the, the history of the site. 
and um, it's so important to the future of the site uh, and, and the client's interest in the site that I'm, I'm going to go through this quite carefully um, because really the whole project is encapsulated in this, this story. Um, the Whittington estate was purchased in 1718 by Balfour on his return from Madras, where he made a lot of money supplying the Royal Navy, the East India Station, and, and probably the army. He was known locally as the Nabob, Nabob, um, the Mughal title applied to those who made fortunes in India. Uh, the family purchased several estates in East Lothian, um, the, the Whittington first, 1817, and then the Papal estate was purchased in 1820. Um, the area in, in pink on the map is the um, um, de garden and designated lands landscape boundary. So that's really the core of the estate within um, the boundary walls. Uh, they then extended from that. Um, the estate passed to A.J. Balfour, uh, who became prime minister, and um, the setting was designed to shelter cattle over winter, store and process grain. Coal-fired steam boiler powered the internal machinery of the granary and the animal feed processes. This is all happening around here. Um, the timing is amazing. In 1877, Queen Victoria was created Empress of India. The papal steading was created at the height of the confidence, power, and wealth of the British Empire. However, um, by 1870, in fact, this whole agricultural system was, was highly suspect. 1870, steamships were transporting grain in bulk from the USA and Canada. And this really threatened the whole basis of European agriculture. Um, in Denmark, for example, they switched completely from grain production to, to dairy. Um, the architects we now know, we've, this is very recent research, the architect and buildings, Francis Farkasen of Haddington, constructions between 1871 and 1874. Now that's really very late for this type of steading. Um, most of them in East Lothian were built somewhat earlier than that. Um, the map is, was sourced by, it was prepared by Simpson and Brown for the conservation plan and previous schemes. The existing steading was removed. The farmhouse at that stage farm formed part of the steading and the machinery was driven by a horse mill. The new steading is a much more efficient and larger layout um, with steam power for the processes. The farmhouse, this is quite important, the farmhouse is then separated from the animals in the workshops, a much more prestigious uh, arrangement. By 18, 1968, the Greaves cottage was unoccupied and the steading was really became um, quite unsuitable for modern machinery. Um, in 2006, an unbuilt scheme was prepared by Simpson and Brown uh, for private houses, it really required a lot of new openings in, in, in the fabric um, in, and, and didn't proceed. In 2017, Steading was purchased by George Mackintosh to fulfill his vision of an agricultural heritage centre. But George is really a very inspiring, visionary entrepreneur. Um, history. Photographs, 1968, Frank Tyndall, former planning officer of East Lothian, Frank Tyndall collection, the principal western elevation of the steading and the ducat. And at that stage, the ventilator fleshes of the stables were intact. The two buildings here were, were stables. Um, we benefited from a set of original drawings in the Whittington Estate archives um, interestingly, not signed and not dated. Um, Principal Western Elevation. And we were looking at the southern part, the Greaves Cottage. Um, very, very efficient, well worked out plan. Um, uh, this is, would be phase two of the project, the 
the buyers and the cattle courts. And we were looking at Greaves Cottage, the implement shed, uh, and a series of workshops, which we refer to as Bothies, really converted them into to, to Bothies. At the back, probably a piggery, um, the first floor of the Greaves Cottage. Qu quite a small, tight building, actually. Um, the roof language here is, I find fascinating. Um, south block, largely pan tiles with slate over the Greaves Cottage. And then the phase two, the main steading, slated over the more important areas, the, the, the granary in particular, stables, uh, where you need to keep things dry. The pan tiles were not quite so waterproof, so that's where the animals are. Um, this is now the north elevation of the south block um, with the implement shed in the middle. Interesting, the implement shed was very important. This is where they kept all the Ferraris and Range Rovers of their agricultural equipment right next to the Greaves Cottage so that you could see what was going on. Um, the carts were around the other side of the setting. and they weren't really very important. Um, Building condition when we arrived, um, uh, George McIntosh was, was very keen from day one that we should remove this dormer window, which, which was a later addition. Um, the setting is deteriorating pretty quickly. Um, building unoccupied since 1968. Um, most of the fabric was very sound. Um, there's an interesting mixture here of zinc gutters, which are not typical for East Lothian, uh, a mixture of zinc and cast iron gutters. Quite a lot of the details you'll find are unusual for, for any part of Scotland. Um, this is, it's, it's good to take pictures in the rain, you see useful things. This stonework was completely saturated. Um, internal condition, grim. Um, very serious rot problems everywhere. Um, okay. um, most of the stonework was sound, the usual problems where you'd expect to find them, chimney, chimney pots and, and the line of chimneys for the worst decay. Um, on, on the implement shed, this is quite common in farm buildings. Um, roof is exposed to wind uplift, so that section of roof is blown away replaced with um, corrugated iron sheeting. Um, most of the stonework is in good condition, uh, serious decay in the timber. Uh, typical details, um, worth noting that to keep these pan tiles waterproof, they really need to be pointed with lime mortar. Uh, the brief, the client's vision and brief, um, we have a remarkable client, uh, an extraordinary man uh, with massive energy and vision. And he saw this building, uh, he had been looking for this building probably since about the 1960s. Um, his um, themes were heritage, business and community. Um, he wanted to include the local community. He wanted to restore the heritage, but it, it had to make money. Um, the Agricultural Heritage Centre was intended to encompass, encompass heritage business and community. Half the setting would be devoted to displaying the heritage of Scottish agriculture and half would be commercial activity to fund the heritage areas. A bit like planning of a mosque um, with the souk underneath. It was intended that no new openings would be made in the setting fabric. Walks and connections to the surrounding environment were intended to extend the scope for exercise, enjoyment, and education. Cameron Webster prepared an initial plan for phase two. Um, we really had to explore the maximum development potential of the site. We had to design the services. At one stage, it was envisaged that the septic tanks would all be in the wooded area, but we actually, the client wanted to use the wood for, as a wood. So we really had to take the services design quite seriously. So we had to know what phase maximum extent of phase two. Um, 
and we hope we put sufficient services below the ground as part of phase one. The farmhouse and papal wood were included in the project as they were purchased. We initially looked at this block here and then subsequently the farmhouse and then and the wood were included. Uh, this was our assessment of the maximum development possible on the site. We chose to take the geometry of, of the cattle court's shelter uh, and put as much on the site as we could given the number of car parking spaces that were required. And, and, and this simply gave us a services layout that we could work with on phase one. Um, connection for phase two, we managed to put septic tanks on this bit of the site rather than in the wood um, and drains going downhill. Um, the brief, really required that, that phase two of the setting would be the heritage and, and commercial part. So we were working on residential accommodation, um, ideally for business groups. Now, the accommodation that we ended up with is, is fantastically flexible. We have two bothies um, and uh, a one and a half story house, which can be used individually or together. Um, and groups of a whole range of sizes can, can use this accommodation. Um, we the, the, the buildings were really quite seriously decaying. So um, we had the opportunity of virtually a um, uh, completely new interior. Um, We've got approximately a 500 mil drop from one end of the site to the other, um, which created slight problems. Um, um, the, the floor levels in the Greaves Cottage, we, we put through as one level, um, which makes wheelchair accessibility much easier. Uh, the usual decay problems, we, we were, forced to really start from scratch. The, the interiors were removed, um, lots of rot and many changes to the interior, but um, most of the masonry was sound. Uh, serious problems in the roof um, and, and usual rot in the, the beam fill at eaves level. Um, the, we we obviously had planning permission and listed building consent, but we, the client decided not to apply for a grant. So we, we were able to replace the roof timbers entirely. Um, working with the existing timber would have been uh, very difficult. There was very heavy um, isolated patches of rot and very heavy um, insect infestation. Um, we also really had to move the, um, the cast iron columns uh, to make it easier to park. Um, and we had to replace the entire beam across the opening with a blue lamb beam. Um, so work underway, um, new pantiles were used, re-slating, um, fairly straightforward. Uh, new roof lights, removing the dormer, putting it on the rear of the building. Uh, this section of walling is fairly typical. It was actually around the wood, um, carried out by um, a, a, a separate stonemason, Giles, who's also a sculptor. Uh, fairly thorough reconstruction of, of the landscape walls. New internal stonework. Um, we had a very good local contractor, Malcolm Patterson, join us, who organised pretty much everything. Um, isolated problems here. This, this, this is a 
but our approach to design here gives a, a, a question mark, which we can talk about later if there's time. Um, iron pins were, were used here to keep the stone slab on this, this canopy detail. And um, as can, can be expected, they caused serious problems, particularly on this side. The, 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 the splitting on this side is worse than on this side. So we actually kept one of these corbels and replaced the entire stone. And of course, that stone is actually the full depth of the wall. It's a real piece of cantilever stonework. So approximately one meter deep piece of new stonework going in there. New stone. Um, the uh, son of the last grieve who had been brought up in the Greaves cottage came to visit George McIntosh uh, fairly recently and was completely astonished at the interior because everything had been completely changed. He didn't recognize a single piece of wood in, in, the, in the interior. However, he did recognize the system which George had taken off the wall and completely refurbished and put back. So that's the only bit of original interior we have. Um, and this is just to illustrate some of the detailed problems that you get when really changing a building completely, and, and Malcolm had this very well. Drone view of phase one cottages, Greaves Cottage, slated roof, new, new situatory, new septic tank for this section of, of the work. And um, we actually changed plans and uh, put new openings into the rear so that each bothy could get out to its own garden barbecue area. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty thorough reconstruction repointing. Um, George's view was that he really did not want to have to come back here and, and, and tackle the pointing in, in different phases. He, he really wanted to do everything in one go. Um, perhaps not an idea of conservation approach, but uh, very practical. And here we have new, new zinc gutters and the new stone canopy with stainless steel pins this time. Um, and we might talk about the use of zinc in this context later. Um, complete renewal of, of the roof structure. New windows, new door, um, new chimney heads, um, slight modern detailing here. Um, new approach and the, the implement shed, which has actually had a whole range of different uses, not, not just car parking, many um, performances and um, meetings taking place there. This is the new plant room for uh, the borehole heat pump um, and uh, wheelchair access from the, the sheltered car park into Breed's Cottage. Um, southeastern view. Um, no solar panels, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a bit upset about that. Um, this is a completely new uh, extension uh, following the form of the original um, extent. Uh, kitchen area, massive new um, sliding window. Um, and new dormer facing the rear. We started to introduce some modern detailing, um, uh, tie down straps in core 10 and core 10 detailing that was intended to continue to phase two. Um, some of the interiors are delightful. This has full wheelchair accessibility. Um, bedroom, wheelchair accessible bedroom with a, a small writing table, uh, kitchen. This is the, one of the effects of changing the floor level. The fireplace is obviously much smaller than it used to be, but the single floor level is, is really important and makes the building so much more usable. Um, I think this is George's sense of fun and um, 
fun is important for the, the corporate environment that is trying to create gain full wheelchair accessibility. Um, we really wanted to go for quality and um, the oak kitchens should last for a very long time. Uh, George wanted the Argus. Um, I'm not quite sure how energy efficient they are, but um, they should last for a long time. Um, kitchens were made by Charles Taylor workshops. This is the Greaves kitchen sitting room. And, and th these windows are important because here the Greaves can actually see what's going on around the steading. Um, this looks across um, the, the main west elevation. New doors made by Morgan Patterson. Uh, and um, a new fireplace, new old fireplace found by George. Bedrooms, all with these narrow writing shelves for laptops for visitors to use. Uh, very high quality Wi Fi throughout. New staircase, um, polished concrete floors, bathroom in the Bothy, one of the Bothy's, Bothy kitchen. Uh, Plowman's body. And adding the wood has really made the whole visitor experience much, much richer. Um, lovely landscape, lots of spring bulbs, and um, new routes. It's, it's not wheelchair accessible, but it's accessible to some extent. Um, and the farmhouse, which was added to the project as we as, as we went along, relationship with the farmhouse to the steady. Um, fifty percent of the area should be commercial, fifty percent heritage. The, these pictures are just to show the flexibility of the spaces that that we have, um, and its use for a whole mixture of business and family groups, um, yoga. All sorts of things have happened here. And um, family group, this is a test run as, as phase one was finished. Um, lots of fun. Now, it's significantly, um, with no alterations to the south block and farmhouse, the entire post production process for the Hollywood film Tar was carried out here. That's quite incredible. And also, it was carried out in secret. Um, energy use. This south block, um, the client's quite happy with it. It was insulated to modern building regulation standards with the borehole heat pump. Um, client's quite happy with the energy performance. The farmhouse, we really didn't have time to, to do very much. Um, it had a, um, a below ground heat pump heating system, but no extra insulation was installed there. And um, that the, the client's quite worried about the long-term energy costs of, of the farmhouse. Um, I think that's it finished. So perhaps Stuart should really take over from now. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much to add there, Ian. So, um, Karen, I think if you want to open it up to Q&A, that might be... Certainly. Thank you very much. Another another really fascinating project. Um, as Ian says, probably the only thing they have in common is their agricultural use in 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 the past. It, interesting to see the approach when you actually have a building which, in the first place, was architect designed, um, and you know how do you actually approach um, the building when when that is the case and there's a very distinct architectural intent in the first place. So I'm going to just, before maybe opening up that kind of discussion, make sure we um, have got um, the Q&As that, the, that have been asked. First of all, um, again, Anne, um, a question for you um, in relation to the incorporation of um, wildlife to the, to the actual, um, to the build. Um, the ask was, is it, was it a planning requirement? I, no, it wasn't a planning requirement. It was something that we had kind of worked through with our client and felt that was 
important when we're bringing landscape into the building that it was important to have that connection with wildlife as well yeah i think i mean i suppose it's you know it's, it's thinking on the way the wider picture you know often we are asked to you know put in the yeah. back boxes etc but you know if we are interested in biodiversity as much in our cities as in our rural areas it's something that you know we should be really thinking about what about the rest of the planet and and um, yeah i know it's good that it was uh, obviously in your case integral and um, again i'm just jumping about um solar panels on the south in, in elevation ian you'd made the comment um that they weren't you, you weren't able to have them and um, was that basically a listed um constraint no, we, 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 I think we got planning permission to have them. I think the, the client um, did some calculations and said they didn't make financial sense, so he didn't install them, um, which I find confusing because, you know, if the calculation didn't be done in Germany, the answer would have been yes, have them. Um, we, we really just had an area over the implement shed, so it, it was possibly 20 metres by four or five metres. Um, uh, I'm disappointed that they weren't installed, but um, apparently it didn't make financial sense. Stuart, do you remember? Uh, uh, yeah, to be fair, it, it was also more with one eye to phase two. Um, the auditorium roof was a much bigger roof. And I think it was felt that once we understood more about the requirements of phase two, it be, we'd be better informed, or the client would be better informed to know exactly what to do. Um, regarding the, the extent of PV, PV panels and batteries, et cetera, the mix of energy that you'd have to create. Now it's that bigger picture, isn't it? Thinking about it longer term. It's quite yeah. interesting to reflect on the two, the two clients sort of drivers in many ways. You know, when you see Anne's, sorry if I've been a bit more poetic bird watching client versus yours, much more interested in, you know, in, in, in issues of you know the long term um, costs and and you know attraction for for it as a going concern. So it's really interesting to see how they they meld two into the actual decisions architecturally and and detail. I think we've got a couple more questions. Um, bear with me. Saw them in the chat. Um, the question was asked Anne about um getting planning. Did you have a difficult um sort of uh, run on that or how did you get on um, no we I, I the, the site actually had full planning permission for something quite different when the client bought the site so we worked quite closely with North Ayrshire planning um, and they were really supportive of what we wanted to do on the site so planning was really smooth we had a yeah we had a good um yeah I, very supportive planning officer. Excellent. And again, Elspeth's given us lots of, uh, have the old walls got a, a DPM has been one of the... And it's it fed by means water and means power. Um, got it. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, so there's um, means power on site. It's a water borehole because there's no means water in that area. So the house is fed off that. There's... um ground source heat pump in trenches out of the back. That's how the building is heated. Um, sorry. EPMs in there. I, so the building was dealt with slightly different because we, in, we put the concrete slab inside the building and then the timber frame is actually the load bearing element. So uh, the stone walls, um, really act as like cladding so there is a waterproof membranes in there there's actually quite a lot of tanking within the project in both the new extension which has got a retaining wall and the older parts of the building yeah so it's quite a complex and and you know tailored it, it responds to that that constructional strategy which becomes the aesthetic as well in the case of the the frame yep yeah Ian, over to you on the planning discussion. Um, again, Elspeth was wondering if you had had a, any particular issues. I don't think we did really. Um, Stuart? Um... Uh, 
No, I mean, there had been previous schemes and permissions granted for residential conversion to various degrees that, that never went anywhere due to the financial um, financial input needed to, to actually do the work at the, the stadium. Um, no, planning and listed building was supportive, phase one and phase two. We actually got planning and listed building consent for phase two. Um, and clearly, you know, there was a recognition that a use had to be found to safeguard the listed steading. Um, so no, they were they were generally supportive the whole way through. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think fundamentally, we you know the 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 use that was proposed fitted into the existing building very well. The client was very concerned. Our brief was that there should be no new openings in in the buildings at all, uh, and. For the most part, we we did manage to fit the activities into spaces quite that, that work. We ended up actually putting some new windows in, but um, a fairly small number. So I think the activity fitted the existing building very well, and therefore there weren't too many problems. I think when we were looking at phase two, there's always the problem of how many cars can you get onto the site, uh, and the balance of building and car parking, we, we reached the conclusion um, that that really didn't, wasn't a problem at phase one. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Again, quite practical, these questions. We're not getting into the discussion about, you know, how you deal with our heritage yet, but I'll keep making sure we're answering the, the, the practical ones. Um, again, to you, Ian and Stuart, uh, what prompted the borehole approach to the heat pump? Um, in our experience, it's the most efficient um, method of, of uh, ground source. Um, there wasn't, initially before George acquired the farmhouse, there wasn't enough ground mm -hmm. to actually use um, ground coil, um, hence the, the boreholes. I think we ended up dropping two or three boreholes um, to, to meet the requirement. Um, it so happens the farmhouse, which he acquired, has a heat pump coil in the field. Um, so interestingly, he's got two heat pumps now, both one with borehole, one with ground source coil. Um, and as Ian alluded to earlier, there's not a lot we could do with the farmhouse, um, you know, insulation, heat pump infrastructure, given the time constraints. But um, no, in my experience, the, the borehole um, is a more predictable um, and consistent method. So again, I'm conscious we're now on dead on <laughs> half one and I, I'm so really tempted to keep the conversation going, but I, I suspect everyone else wants to get back um, to their, their, uh, <laughs> their, their desks, basically. Um, there's lots of things that, that I personally, you know, thought about when, when seeing these great projects, specifically the the approach to aesthetics that Anne's project um, throws up, and you know the 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 beauty of the old and our entire you know desire sometimes to make things perfect when actually it's more about composing something of existing materials. I think these are these are conversations I'm hoping we're going to have more. And I think there was a hint from Ian of you know the conversation around what about the climate change how does that affect the materials we might use in existing buildings i don't know if that's where you were heading with the talking about the rainwater goods but these are really important i don't know um i'm going to just say that the next members forum um for ris is on um sorry i had to uh, friday the 10th of november it's in person and it's in the merchant's house and it's called beyond the bothy so I don't know if these conversations will be had there, but if not, I think hopefully we will be having them in the future because both of these projects are so sensitive to their existing buildings, but very much of the now and of, of, of the things that we do. But just to say thank you very much. It was really great to see the projects, great to hear all about them. And hopefully we will, as I say, continue the conversation that, that the projects um, highlight. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.